And grace to you in peace from God our Creator and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Good morning. Oh, it's so good to see all of you here this morning to worship uh, God on this Indigenous Peoples Sunday. It's the first Sunday I know of that we as a church have been focusing in on that, that particular holiday that's now an official one here in New Mexico along with 11 other states across the country. And so our Hymns will be focused in on Native American hymns. Our prayers will be the same. And my message will be focused um, on some on Indigenous Peoples Day. So glad you're with us uh, this day. I want to remind us that we are sitting on, in, and this church is sitting on Indigenous land. There were peoples here before us, people who lived this land, worked this land, thrived on this land, and so we acknowledge them this day, and it should be every day to remember. Good morning. The call to worship this morning is sort of a little bit of choreography in it. As you will see, you, we will be facing different directions, one quarter turn for each direction. And we'll start off by going to the east, then to the south, then to the west, and back to the north. You do not have to read anything. I will take care of that. So let us face the east. This is where the sun comes up, and so the direction of new beginnings, hope, promise, and potential. Pray that you may be open to receiving these gifts this day. To the south. This is the direction of warmth, growth, fertility, also known as creativity and productivity. In addition, this direction represents faith, trust, and faithfulness in relationships. To the west, this is the direction where the sun goes down. This is the direction of rest of our dream lives and of closure and endings that need to take place in order for there to be new beginnings. Pray for these things this day. And to the north. This is the direction of the cold, of winds, of strength, courage, fortitude, might, single-mindedness, focus, clarity, and purpose. Pray for these things this day. Now turn upward. For Native Americans, this is the direction of Father Sky. Pray that your heart, mind, soul, and spirit will not forget to look upward this day to the one who is so much greater than we are. Turn downward and touch our mother, the earth. Pray that everything you do this day will be in honor and reverence of your mother, earth. Turn inward, place your hand on your heart and pray that all you do this day will be true to the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit who dwells within you. Amen. Please be seated. This morning, scripture is a reading from Paul's letters, 1 Corinthians 6, 1 through 6. When any of you have a grievance against another, do you dare to take it to court before the unrighteous instead of it taking it before the saints? Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world is to be judged by you, are you incompetent to try trivial cases? Do you not know that we are to judge angels to say nothing of ordinary matters? If you have ordinary cases then, do you appoint as judges those who have no standing in the church? I say to you, your shame. Can it be that there is no one person wise enough to decide between brothers and sisters? Instead, brothers and sisters go to court against one another, and this before the unbelievers. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to 
Seems like a long time since I've seen you last. Been gone for two Sundays back east in the Midwest doing an installation service, a, a wedding in Columbus installation back in New York City for an old friend in New York uh, area and a lot of family and friends in between. But now I'm back and so glad to be so. And I'm starting something new. For years and years, the mainline church and other churches across the country and world have really focused in on doing scriptures that are based on the Revised Common Lectionary. Revised Common Lectionary, that's why I choose certain scriptures over other ones. I have a, I've mentioned this before, I believe, but I have four choices every Sunday using this lectionary, and I choose one of them, and every three years, it's the same four scriptures again for this Sunday. A few weeks ago, I realized that, you know, I've been doing these scriptures on and off since, well, since the late 90s, I think, when I first realized there was a revised common lectionary that came into being in 1994, based on a, a common lectionary that came in 1983, based on a COCU, which is a COCU, it's Churches of Christ Uniting, in 1973, they had a lectionary based on a Roman Catholic lectionary in 1969. And I hope you have all those dates down. <laughs> Just write them down in your bulletin. Based on the Second Vatican Council in the early 1960s to do something different. It occurred to me then a few weeks ago, as I was looking again at scriptures I had done three years ago, that there are a vast number of scriptures that we never hear. And that the people who made these revised common lectionaries are mostly white men, if not all white men. We need to expand our horizons, expand the possibilities of what we listen to and hear and study every Sunday, I thought. And so I found a new lectionary for this year. It's called A Woman's Lectionary for the Whole Church put together by a Hebrew scholar, an African-American woman at Bright Theological Seminary in Texas. And I have loved reading what she has to say. It's not in our bulletin, the actual scripture or translation that she had because of copyright issues. But the insights takes us way to the margins of the world, of society, of lifting up stories that we had never probably heard before. And so I do so today. I've never preached on 1 Corinthians 6, 1 through 6. It was never in the lectionary. But now it is in this one. So with that little foundation, let's begin our time with a prayer, so let us all bow in prayer. Gracious God, holy God, for the beauty of this day, we give you thanks. And how you bring us news of your love every morning. So be with us then in our eyes, in our seeing, our ears, in our hearing, our lives, in our living this day, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I couldn't find the right mystery. I was in Chicago this past week. I'd finished my mystery novel on the plane and then visiting friends and family, and it was over. And so I went to a bookstore, a little small bookstore, around Ukrainian village in Chicago, west side of Chicago, close to where our daughter lives. I looked for probably 45 minutes for the right mystery to, to continue my little mystery thing when I go on vacations. No more theology, no more something important. Just do something fun, right? I could not find one. Short selection, I thought. And where's the newest Louise Penny, I was saying to myself. It isn't out yet. And so I was looking around, and I realized that I'm not going to find a mystery. I don't like these other kind of genres. But this one book caught my eye. It's called Starry Messenger by Eric deGrasse Tyson. Maybe you know his name. I've heard him on the radio. I've heard him on on MSNBC, I've heard him on other places. He's an astrophysicist, he's African-American. He grew up in the Bronx, he, he's been a professor and, at Princeton and all other places, I think I got that right. 
And he opened up a whole new world to me of astrophysics. No, he really didn't. I, I don't know a thing about it. But, sorry, Jim, I just, I just had to be truthful. You know, I just don't. But the stories he was telling were fascinating. In fact, even one time, in one of the chapters, I read about Jim Lovell. Remember the, Jim Lovell, the commander of Apollo 13? And they had some writings about Jim Lovell in there. I thought, okay, I can, I can get this book. And so I, I would leaf through the chapters and not read all the chapters all in chronological order, but found one chapter on inventions. And it caught my eye. It talked about how uh, Tyson just said, just suppose that we take 30-year intervals and we'll start with 1870. That the people in 1870 would have no idea what the world would be like in 1900, 30 years later. Imagine the life they lived then and then what happened in those 30 years. And then 1900 to 1930. Couldn't imagine those 30 years from the beginning to end. 30 to 60, 60 to 90. Getting closer to my aware years, of course. And 1990 to... 2020, he outlined all the different inventions from transportation to technology. You know, remember that story I may have told you back in 1990, that's when the story took place back in my first church in the northern suburbs of Chicago, and we had the Illinois Bell president in our congregation, and he brought his engineer with him for a men's breakfast. About a hundred men showed up that morning, and he took out this little contraption we never really saw before. But he said, gentlemen, this is the future. In fact, each one of you will have your own phone number. And you could hear that oohs and ahs across the whole breakfast area, right? Imagine in 1990 to what we know now, all the things that have happened. It's astounding. And then I thought, Wait a second, I'm in the church. I've been in the church all my life. I've been a pastor for all these decades. And I think, you know, the church doesn't always look forward as much as, in my experience, looking backwards to the good old days, right? Oh, we have a, a, a scant number of people worshiping today in the sanctuary as opposed to what it was before the pandemic, as opposed to what it was probably in 19... 90 or 1970 or 1950, the golden year of, of the mainline church, right, people think? We look back often more than we might want to look forward because we're scared of the future about where the church might be and if it's going to be at all. But if you were to read all the scriptures from the lectionaries and all the scriptures in between, you would realize that God is always pointing us to the future and not reminiscing all about the past. Oh, now we do reminisce, and God is always helping us to recall all those great stories of our faith, you know, the exodus and returning from the exile and, and so forth. But that was always with the idea that we took those great themes of, of our faith and make them applicable today in our own world. From slavery to promised land, what's our promised land today? How can we get rid of all that enslaves us today so we move forward in some sense of freedom and, and excitement? You know, those kind of ideas, returning home after exile. We live in exile. How do we make that exile something where we feel good about moving forward into a new world? Those are the ideas that God always brings up that we talk about. how different it is than to read the scripture this morning. I would think that after all these centuries that we would be better than what we're reading in scripture. Remember, we always have new inventions, new technology moving forward. The church looks back a lot, but we have a lot of things to look forward to. But in our scripture this morning, it's all about the law and 
reports. And all these people in this church in Corinth were taking others to court. Not to the court inside the church, that burgeoning young community. They were taking it to the courts of the power system that they lived in, the courts of the empire. They were trusting somebody would adjudicate their issue in a court such as that where only the powerful seem to get their way. That's how the courts were set up in that particular area, that, in that Corinthian city. You know, Corinth was one of those bustling cities of commerce and trade. It was at the crossroads where people came from all across the world, and there were people from everywhere, and they looked different, and they, they all these new ideas, and they were the same people in the church. Anyone have any idea how big that Corinthian church was? It was the largest church that Paul ever dealt with in his letters. Anyone have any idea the number of people in that congregation? About 70. We hear so much about the Corinthian church, the Ephesian church, the Roman church, and they only had about 70 people. A little more than what we have now with us today in this service. Imagine what they did. Imagine what 70 people can do. But imagine that was the church. We long to look back on and say, oh, those were the days. But they still had issues that we're dealing with today. All the power things that are happening where some people get justice, many people don't. Often by the color of their skin, the culture they come from, the language they speak. Fast forward now. What if today, all of us, try to figure out the next 30 years in the church? What would it look like? Remember, it never looked the same in the 30 years before than it did that at that moment. What would the church look like? Oh, at the first service, we have a situation where we can, you know, have a conversation. We're a little closer together. We're upstairs in the rooftop garden. We, we can talk about all these things. But we can do the same thing here in this place. Do you have any idea, ideas, what the church should look like, could look like, might look like? And some of you might be saying, well, maybe the church won't be around in 30 years. And that's what some people seem to always say. There are always those people who always say, well, we're not going to, no, sorry, no, we're going to, no. Any ideas? I have a few, a few from upstairs. But if you have any, please join in the conversation about what you hope for the church, what you think the church might be doing instead of what we're doing now, what it might look like instead of what we see right now. Any ideas? Any hopes, dreams for the church, 30 years from now, 20, 20 to 2050? Pardon me? A yearning to be part of the church. A yearning to be part of the church. That those that are here in the church, let's say up to 2050, let's say, so they, they really yearn to be part of a community like this. It means something in their life. Yeah, okay. There's a yearning in the church. Do you feel that now at all? Hopefully you do. Maybe not. A yearning. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Anyone else? Maybe going back to home churches, Marianne says. Back to what it was in the, in the beginning where they couldn't meet in church. They didn't have church buildings. They had homes, houses. And the people in the Corinth church, let's say, uh, some were rich, some were poor. Some had larger homes than others, and others didn't. They had apartments. You couldn't fit 70 people into most of the dwellings back then. That may have limited their number. Who knows? But to have home churches where it's about the community, not about the building. Home churches where you get to know each other and wrestle with all the issues of living. Where people are trying that these days, again, it's so hard to keep church buildings going. We know that in, in this congregation, how to have a beautiful facility, but it costs a lot of money. And so people may not have a building anymore, but they're still meeting. So home churches. I elaborated a little bit. Anyone else? Wait, let me, I'll give you a few ideas myself. I hope that in the next, next year, now, but at least 30 years from now, that we will be, as a Christian family, 
a diverse family. And no longer would Dr. King said in the 60s that the worship hour on Sunday morning is the most segregated hour in the week in our society. Is that true? So, yeah, it's still true. There are some congregations that are breaking out of that, but mostly we're still looking the same. Color-wise, age-wise, accent-wise, whatever-wise, we still come from the same brand. Okay, maybe one day we will find ourselves in such a diverse community that it opens our lives up so that we might have all these ideas from other people, from other places, and we are still one. Oh, that would be a beautiful sight to see. Just a beautiful sight. And so maybe even now we work on how we do that. Where I came from in my previous churches, same demographics. And I'm always astounded by that still in this day and age. Wouldn't it be great if we were more the Corinthian look than we were today's look? Just a thought. Oh, here's another one. It comes with a story. I was in my first congregation in the northern suburbs of Chicago, and I went in just to, to see if there's anyone I know still left. I mean, I saw a memorial garden plaque uh, on the wall going inside the church. They have a memorial garden off the side, outside, and I saw all these names of all my friends that had died, especially in the last five years. And I said, oh. And I walked in, and I, I saw a few people. They didn't know me, but I told them who I was, and I, I got in. And there was a long hallway next to the sanctuary. It's still a beautiful sanctuary. And they renovated a, a part of the church. It used to be a choir room and with walls on all sides, of course. And that's where my picture was associates of that church and senior pastors. It's not there anymore. It's okay. <laughs> but I remembered one scene. I've told you this story before. I'll say it again. In 1985, Linda Loving, who was a Paris associate here, we were associates together. And I was doing a children's term up in front before the kids all go off to a side door off to their church school classes. There must have been 25 kids there. Remember the year 1985. And so I do the little message, and we go outside the doors, and a young teacher approached me right then, and she had a pressing question. It had to do with a co-teacher who was an elderly woman who helped, helping her out, and she was having difficulties. And so she was telling me, I was talking back, responding to her as the kids were flitting off, and all of a sudden I hear the microphone from inside the sanctuary, and Linda Loving's up there doing the next part of the service, and she says, Oh, that Harry, he's always trying to show me up. And I'm thinking, what in the world? Until I see a figure coming down that hallway that's no longer there. There's now a big, beautiful reception area, not a choir room, with my picture on the wall. One of those. Someone, an usher's racing down. And he comes up and he says, Harry, your microphone is on. Right? And I looked up, and I'm thinking the whole time, you know, what have they heard? Have I just messed up my whole life and career? Like, you know, has this person, you know. And who was the usher? Well, Jim Lovell. The same astronaut who actually was in the book I just saw. And that reminded me of that story, actually. It was Jim Lovell who was a member of that church. Jim Lovell who commanded Apollo 13. Jim Lovell, who took this little crew in this little Apollo capsule and, against all odds, made it back. He was telling all those stories before the movie was made. All, anyone who would hear, all of our youth and kids would hear these stories from Jim Lovell, but he couldn't anymore. Now Tom Hanks is playing Jim Lovell, right, in the movie. I thought to myself then, if anyone could deal with a crisis as bad as this one, it's Jim Lovell, right? He said, turn off your microphone. But I'm thinking now, 
I need to keep the microphone on. The church does too. We need to keep the microphone on and share the wisdom we have from the heritage we come from, from the work we try to do in the community, for the love and compassion and forgiveness and mercy that we try to exhibit in this place to show the community. And we need to keep our microphone on or at least have strong enough voices to share that with the world around us, to, to stand up for those who are oppressed, to remember Indigenous Peoples Day as we are in front of you right now, as we are in our hymns, as we are in this scripture where people who look differently than the power culture don't get the same benefits. And we need to stop that. Keep the microphone on. Make sure our voice is heard. So I think Jim, Lo Jim Lovell is still around, I found out. Thank you, Jim Lovell, for helping me understand this now, that maybe I keep my microphone on. Maybe we all do. And wouldn't it be something if the church was known in the community as a place that was accepting of all people, that lifted people up, that worked on justice issues for people on the margins, that made sure that people had what they needed to live, that we were known as a church that really served all humanity, people of nonviolence. Just a few weeks ago, I, I referred to our hymnals, and I'll refer to it again. What if we were a church that really spoke glory to God and really sang glory to God which means from the second century it meant a human being fully alive that's what glory to God meant to Irenaeus back in the second century an early Celt what if we were to be a church where everyone felt coming in that they could be fully alive and share who they are or they could go out these doors into the community and be fully alive to all they meet in the life around them. Ooh. We have 30 years to figure some things out according to that book I got back in that bookstore back in Chicago. 30 years, says Eric deGrasse Tyson. Just kind of arbitrary, but 30 years. What do we want to be 30 years from now? To me, it's a mystery. I looked for a mystery and I couldn't find one, but we have a mystery anyway with that idea. What will we be? All the thoughts we've had today, maybe it won't happen. Oftentimes you think we know what's going to happen. We don't know what's going to happen. But we can certainly start and dream. And the more we dream and talk, the more things can become visible to us. Oh, I would love it that if a mystery turned into something practical here in the church, here in the community, here in the world, that we indeed were fully alive and shared our lives with one another in mercy and compassion and with forgiveness. Oh, thanks be to God for our scripture. Thanks be to God for this congregation. And thanks be to God for the years ahead. They can be exciting ones. Amen. <laughs>